The Palestinian death toll continues to soar in Gaza as the humanitarian crisis worsens. Hello, I'm Arnold Nido and this is The Heat. About 27,000 Palestinians have now been killed in Gaza as Israel presses ahead with the military campaign which it says is aimed at destroying Hamas. We will get an Israeli perspective later in the program, but we begin with a one-on-one -on -one interview with Hanan Ashrawi, the longtime Palestinian politician, leader, activist and scholar, talked with me earlier from Ramallah. Hanan Ashrawi, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, let's start with the current situation in Gaza. According to figures, the latest figures we have from the Gaza Ministry of Health, almost 27,000 Palestinians have been killed since October 7th, 10,000 of them children. Uh, more than 2 million Palestinians have been displaced, their homes reduced to rubble. What is mm -hmm. your assessment of what's happening in Gaza right now? Well, it's very clear. This is an ongoing genocide taking place in plain sight uh, with total complicity by the U.S. and some Western countries. And even when the International Court of Justice and others do take decisions, uh, preliminary measures and so on, provisional measures, uh, Israel treats them with total disdain and just continues with the slaughter and with the massacre of the innocents with full determination in order to uh, complete its, its uh, genocide and in order to carry out the uh, evacuation of Gaza, the forced displacement, and in order to establish its total control over the area. This is uh, really unconscionable. It's something unprecedented. Uh, we could say that if this is happening in the dark or nobody knows and so on, that there might be some excuse, but this is happening in plain sight, this is happening with total intent, this is happening in total defiance of the international community and the global legal system. And yet the whole world stands by helplessly and allows Israel to continue. This is unacceptable. This is certainly uh, the, the death knell of the uh, international or multilateral system, and it certainly exposes the moral failure of uh, the world, particularly the West or the global North. And if we look at another development recently, just in the past few days, Israel recently accused a dozen employees of the United Nations Relief and Works Agency, known as UNRWA, of taking part in the October 7th attacks in Israel. Now, since that accusation, the United States and its allies have halted funding to uh, this organization. And as we are all aware, UNRWA plays a key role, a vital role in the welfare of Palestinians. It has been doing so for several decades. Uh, but now we've got this halt to funding. And, and of course, that's added to the fact that, you know, Palestinians are homeless, they're starving, they have no health care, they have no access to water, no access to any kind of energy. Um, in fact, the head of the World Health Organization says the withholding of funds will have, quote, this is what he said, catastrophic consequences. What further impact will it have on Palestinians? Absolutely, because the Palestinians in Gaza have no shelter, have no homes, have no infrastructure, have no clean water, no food, no medicines. Even those who sheltered in UNRWA schools and in hospitals, they were shelled and the schools destroyed uh, and so on. Now, the fact that Israel Actually, this is really, it's, it's quite evil, I would say, because Israel has the list of all the UNRWA employees. They submit them to, to Israel. And they decided, even though they did have suspects, as they said, uh, UN Watch is one of the arms of Israeli propaganda and, and espionage. <clears throat> and it uh, accused these people, but they kept the, the so-called information secret till after the decision of the ICJ, and then they uh, declared that this is it, and the world, the Western world, as you rightfully said, decided to immediately jump and cut off aid to UNRWA, now on our funding uh, to UNRWA. UNRWA is a vital, vital provider of services, of shelter, of food, and uh, in, in the midst of this catastrophe, anyway, in the midst of this genocide, to add 
more suffering, more pain, just makes them even more complicit in this genocide. Now, if in any country, if you had only 0.04% who were uh, implicated in violence, that means that this is a, a very, very small number compared to, let's say, a whole Israeli army that is implicated in war crimes, in massacres, in slaughters, in, in the, the killing of civilians, in the point-blank executions of helpless captives, and, and, and entering hospitals and killing pa helpless patients. That is where the real horror lies, not with the fact that maybe some UNRWA employees, 0.04%, were implicated in something. This is incredible. And the predisposition by the West to believe anything Israel says, from the 400 children to the rapes of I don't know how many women to the beheading, of, they believe anything, any lie that Israel presents. And at the same time, they totally disregard Palestinian lives, Palestinian rights, the Palestinian narrative itself. And they continue the, the victimization of the Palestinians. And they continue with the impunity of Israel, not just shielding Israel, but providing Israel with support, with weapons, and with time to continue with the slaughter. So this is where we are now. This is compounding the injustice. There is no will also to bring to bear the, the applicability and the implementation of the uh, ICJ uh, uh, ruling, or even the applicability of international humanitarian law, the post Geneva Convention and everything else, because after all, this is not just the situation of, a, of slaughter, of an attack on a captive, helpless population, but it is also a situation of occupation in which Israel has been an occupying power for uh, decades and getting away with everything, literally, without any accountability, because the West decides to drop the term occupation from its lexicon and to provide Israel with all the excuses and support it needs. Now, this is unacceptable. This is a total distortion, not just of basic legal uh, systems, but also of the minimal level of decency, humanity, and morality. And we should note that those employees of UNRWA who've been accused of taking part in the October 7th attacks, that's just an allegation. Nothing's been proved in court. But I want to get to the ICJ ruling. You mentioned that a moment ago. It issued an interim ruling uh, on last Friday ordering Israel to take all measures to prevent genocide. But it stopped short of calling for a ceasefire. What is your response to the court orders that were issued? I think it's a very important court order because the provisional measures talk about the fact that, uh, first of all, there is jurisdiction by the ICJ, it talks about plausibility of the uh, uh, possibility or plausibility of uh, genocide being committed, and it did call upon Israel to stop. Uh, it used legal terms, it didn't use political terms, yes, and it didn't call on both sides because Israel is the country that is implicated and is being, in this case, accused and all the evidence uh, pertains to Israel. So now Israel has to comply. It is a binding resolution. It's a binding order. And it should cease and desist. It should immediately stop its slaughter, its massacre, its destruction of everything that uh, sustains life in Gaza, from schools to hospitals to universities to infrastructure to food uh, and, and water reservoirs and so on. This is something that Israel has to do. It is not a suggestion, and it is not up to question. And I believe that this ruling is very significant because for the first time in its history, Israel is implicated and Israel is being held to account by the highest legal body. Israel has always enjoyed impunity, preferential treatment, exceptionalism, and so on, because the U.S. primarily shielded it and protected it even from its own uh, crimes and mistakes. So now it is time that Israel is treated like other countries and has to face the consequences of its actions. Unfortunately, we do not see the political will to do that. On the contrary, we see Israel, we see the U.S. and its allies rushing madly, mindlessly to protect their colonial outpost, to protect the one country that is committing genocide as I said, in plain sight, and yet they decide to punish 
uh, UNRWA, the, the one agency that is helping the Palestinians, and at the same time, they grant Israel more time to act with greater violence and with greater impunity. And Israel really thumbed its nose at everybody, even its allies. It is going about its own business. It is, as you know, today they, they discovered that there were 30, but I'm sure there are many more bodies of, of people that Israel captives, that Israel yeah. abducted, tied up, blindfolded, and shot point blank and buried in the rubble and the garbage. Okay, let's look at the view from Israel uh, on this ruling, which was handed down by the ICJ. Israel's Prime Minister, Benjamin Netanyahu, he denounced those charges of genocide against Israel as, quote, outrageous. That's what he called them. He says Israel will continue to defend itself while abiding by international law. What do you make of that? Uh, this is absolute fiction. First of all, Israel is an occupying power. And no occupier can claim self-defense against its uh, victims and, and the people under its occupation and oppression, number one. So this whole excuse of self-defense has been used repeatedly to bash, slaughter, massacre the Palestinians. There is no self-defense here. And of course, what Israel is doing is uh, uh, genocide, and it should be held to account on that basis. And they never, never... Uh, respected or implemented international law, including the laws of war, even though it was Israel that unilaterally declared war on on Gaza, on a population that that is really defenseless, that has already been mm -hmm. held captive for decades, bare, with the bare minimum requirements of life, and of course uh, now totally uh, helpless and at the mercy of this uh, again this this slaughter and and uh, merciless killing. So that's the thing. And, and to claim that, and at the same time to, to treat the, the highest court in the world yeah. with such contempt as they do normally, yeah. and to say that we will continue, it, it means that there is not just intent as proven by the court, but there is willful and deliberate intention right. not to defy the court ruling and to persist in its war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. Right. I don't know, I've just got a little bit of time left. Uh, one final question, and that is, you know, as we've been discussing, most of Gaza's infrastructure has been destroyed, homes have been destroyed, vital infrastructure gone, medical facilities razed to the ground. We are hearing more and more from Israelis who want to see the forced deportation of Palestinians, Palestinians driven out of Gaza entirely, completely. What are your biggest fears for Gaza, and what do you think Israel ultimately has in store for Gaza and its people? Well, we hear different messages and different statements of intent. Of course, the conference that was held with the participation of some Likudniks and uh, uh, Ben-Gvir and Smotrich and these fascist uh, right-wing uh, members of the government coalition, they are calling openly for the expulsion of Palestinians, the repetition of the Nakba, of the catastrophe of 1948, uh, the uh, dispossession of the Palestinians, the expelling them, uh, which is, again, uh, part of the genocidal policies in, in Gaza, and at the, restore, at the going back to settling Gaza, at stealing the land and bringing in Israelis, which is a war crime to live in Gaza. So they want to uh, take Gaza, to annex Gaza, to expel the Palestinians and to build illegal yeah. settlements there. Hanan Ashrawi, thanks for joining us. You're most welcome. And for more now, we are joined by Dan Arbel, a veteran of the Israeli Foreign Service. He is currently a scholar in residence at the Center for Israeli Studies at American University. Also with us is Joel Rubin. He is a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration. And with us too is Michael Link. He is a former UN Special Rapporteur for Human Rights in the Palestinian Territories. Welcome to all of you. Dan Arbel, some very tough language used there by Hanan Ashrawi, accusing Israel of what she called an ongoing genocide taking place in plain sight. She also said that there's been a moral failure on the part of the international community. What is your response to what she said? Uh, well, first of all, um, any loss of life uh, is tragic, and especially of innocent civilians, uh, it is regretful. I would say that uh, Ms. Ashrawi, not for the first time, has uh, not uh, condemned, not even mentioned October 7th, the reason for Israel to launch this war against Hamas, in which 1,200 Israelis were slaughtered, beheaded some of them, 
women raped, 250 Israeli civilians abducted, and still 136 are held in Gaza. Uh, horrendous atrocities committed by Hamas, which warranted an Israeli uh, reaction. Now, uh, many things that Ashrawi said, I, I totally reject. It's not genocide. You know, we can debate whether Israel's use of force is excessive or expansive. Uh, there may be a debate about that. Israel abides by international treaties. Israel is not committing genocide. Is With the regard to the ICJ discussions and deliberations, Israel is fully cooperating with the ICJ and will continue to cooperate, including, uh, <clears throat> you know, forwarding any information that is relevant to the investigation and to the court case uh, carried out, you know, uh, brought to the ICJ by South Africa, acting as an arm of Hamas. Uh, you know, just the, the numbers that you, Anand, quoted of 27,000, these are totally incorrect. And by the way, uh, while thousands of Gazans have died, many of them innocent civilians, many, many of the dead in Gaza are Hamas fighters, and you're, they're counted as part of those that died uh, as a result, and you know, I think that there should be a, a clear distinction between Hamas fighter and innocent civilians. And going back to what Ashrawi said about schools and about hospitals, which Hamas uses as launching sites for its rockets and for operations and headquarters, and using citizen innocent civilians and human as human shields, all that you know leads the IDF to attack these facilities <clears throat> reluctantly. But then, un unfortunately, some civilians get uh, hurt in this course of action. But I, I totally reject Ms. Ashrawi's accusations. And, uh, you know, she can say genocide from today till tomorrow. It's utterly false. And I'd be happy to answer any other questions you may have later. Okay, Joel Rubin, uh, Ashrawi is also very critical of that decision by the United States and its allies to suspend funding to UNRWA, the aid organization. Um, you know, after they were accused, or it's a dozen of its employees were accused of taking part in the October 7th attack in Israel. Um, what do you make of her criticism of that decision? Well, you know, Anand, this is certainly a conundrum uh, for the United States and for the international community, because it is a priority to provide aid to the Palestinian people. As Dan said, uh, any loss of life is, uh, is a tragedy. And the Biden administration and governments around the world, governments in the Middle East, do want to see aid get to the Palestinians. Now, of course, Hamas is creating problems for that. Uh, Israel also is, is not being easy when it comes to moving aid in. But what's the mechanism? It's UNRWA. Uh, it's the, the, this organization that now suddenly does not have the ability to do that. So there needs to be accountability. Uh, I think the State Department was right to pause uh, support for UNRWA and the United States, we were not alone. Multiple governments uh, paused the, the funding and because this is a, a, this is a real um, uh, embarrassment at a minimum and, if it, and, it, and worse, uh, a real travesty uh, runs counter to the mission, the mission of protecting the Palestinian people. Hopefully this will be resolved and aid can continue and flow uh, because without aid getting to the Palestinian civilians there, there will be increased casualties. It is devastating for them right now, and uh, they don't need any more bad news, and this certainly is bad news for the Palestinian civilians. Michael Link, uh, Ashrawi hailed that ruling by the International Court of Justice that calls on Israel to take all steps to prevent a genocide in Gaza. Uh, what is your, we haven't talked since that ruling was handed down, but what is your assessment of the ruling and the orders that were handed down, uh, which fell short of calling for a ceasefire? Look, it's a remarkable ruling. I don't think there's any way that um, Israel or those who would speak on its behalf uh, can wind up spinning that away. Uh, the International Court heard a substantive argument from South Africa and largely accepted uh, what it said. It quoted uh, numerous UN officials to talk about the humanitarian catastrophe on the ground. So it said there's a plausible case with respect to genocidal acts, uh, given the high death toll, given the use of starvation and the either denial or the obstruction of humanitarian aid getting into the two million plus Palestinians in, in Gaza. It also pointed to the plausibility of genocidal intent. It quoted not simply uh, media figures or, uh, or isolated figures in Israeli society. It quoted the president of Israel. It quoted the uh, 
uh, Minister of Defense, and it quoted the now Foreign Minister uh, of Israel with respect to uh, dehumanizing language they, they've, they've been using with respect to describing uh, Palestinians. The provisional orders are very important. It said Israel must do everything in its power to try to uh, stop acts that may uh, constitute genocide, including the killing of Palestinians, the causing of serious bodily and, uh, and mental harm, uh, and it said it also had to allow humanitarian aid to the degree it was needed uh, uh, to meet the needs of the Palestinian population in, in Gaza. It also uh, directed Hamas to release uh, the, all of the remaining Israeli hostages there. I don't think there's any way around by saying that's a, that's a substantial uh, victory for South Africa in its, uh, in its application. You're right, there was no ceasefire order. So I would say this decision uh, is a glass of water three quarters full, but there's really no way uh, that Israel could wind up abiding by the provisional measures issued by the court, which are legally binding, unless it stopped uh, its uh, its operations and uh, imposed a or ab obeyed uh, a ceasefire in uh, in Israel. Sorry, in Gaza. Dan, what is your uh, response to what we just heard from Michael? Um, you know, the fact that Israel now must take measures to prevent a genocide taking place and the fact that for these orders to be implemented, there will effectively have to be some kind of ceasefire. So, again, I would say, first of all, that Israel is uh, in Gaza um, has been fighting a war of self-defense. I would also go on to say that the ICJ, that Israel is fully cooperating with the ICJ. And Israel will and is supposed to and has already been uh, <clears throat> bringing to the ICJ's attention different documents that point to Israeli actions to which 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 uh, negate these allegations made by by South Africa, which serves as an arm of Hamas. I'd also say that uh, you know what ask you also what country in the world would be fighting an enemy and at the same time providing that enemy humanitarian assistance? It's unheard of. Electricity, fuel, water, supplies, and, and it's ongoing on a daily basis, perhaps limited in fashion, but it is ongoing. And, and, and to cap it all, Israel is engaged as we speak in negotiations to try and work out a deal in which some hostages will be released and returned for a temporary ceasefire. So there are attempts to kind of uh, bring to, uh, and that, that will allow further humanitarian assistance to flow into Gaza. So I think that, you know, this is complicated. The war is ongoing. It's in its fourth month. Uh, you know, it may take a very long time until it's over, but Israel has to ensure that October 7th did not happen again. And it has to convince its citizens to move back to their homes, you know, promising them that October 7th will not happen again. And therefore, it has to do a lot in order to make sure that Hamas is out of the equation, in order to ensure the safety and the security of uh, the south, southern part of Israel. Joel, uh, in that uh, discussion with Hanan Ashrawi, she referenced that conference that took place in Jerusalem over the weekend. It was a conference of far-right members in uh, Israel. There were calls for the expulsion of Palestinians from Gaza and the resettlement of Israelis in the territory. At least 10 members of the Israeli cabinet were at that conference, including the National Security Minister Itamar ben Gavir and the Finance Minister uh, Bezalel Smotrich. Uh, this is what the organizer of that conference, her name is Daniela Weiss, this is what she told Britain's Channel 4 network. Let's uh, listen. There will be no Arabs in the Gaza Strip. They will go to Turkey, to Scotland, to Britain. They don't want to kill them. I want them out of Gaza and we'll use different methods. One of them is not to give them any humanitarian aid, so the countries of the world will have pity on them and take them. So, Joel, what do you say to Palestinians who fear Israel's real goal is to make Gaza unlivable for them, uh, remove them, and then resettle the area with Israelis? First, I want to comment on, on, on those uh, deplorable statements, uh, horrific comments by Daniela Weiss and by those who were at this uh, conference, uh, this carnival of hate, uh, that has no place uh, in, in, uh, in, in civilized societies. Uh, this should not be framed as a war against an entire population. Uh, let's remember that there are more than 2 million Palestinian citizens of Israel who are loyal,
good citizens in the state of Israel. And, and they must be wondering uh, why these people are even close to the government and, and power. Uh, certainly here uh, from this vantage point, uh, this runs counter to everything that we know about Israel as a state that is a democracy and that is trying to find ways to live in peace and fight Hamas as it should be fighting Hamas right now for its own national security. So uh, what she's saying is a completely dangerous uh, position. It's one that would undermine Israel's long-term security. And yeah. for Palestinians to hear that, uh, I think it feeds into their deepest, darkest fears. The good news is that that's not what the prime minister is saying. It's not what the defense minister is saying. That's not what the opinion is of the majority of Israelis. But uh, there has to be more uh, actions, not just words, from the prime minister to distance from this kind of rhetoric. Unfortunately, and I'll say this very directly, unfortunately, there are members of his yeah. cabinet, like Itamar Ben-Gavir, who mirror this kind of language. And, uh, and Ben Gavir seems to be running circles around Netanyahu right now okay. on the rhetoric, and that is very dangerous, and that needs to stop. Okay. Don Abel, uh, what are your thoughts on that conference that took place and the sentiments that were expressed there? I agree uh, fullheartedly with Joe, uh, with all that he said. I would just want to add, these, are, uh, these members, Daniela Weiss and others, uh, it's deplorable. Uh, they're on the fringes of this uh, coalition. Uh, their, their comments do not represent the official policy of the Israeli government. And I agree that Mr. Netanyahu should be uh, say more, do more to distance himself from this, and he's not doing so for political reasons. Right. Uh, but I think that, in general, uh, yeah. these are fringe elements that should not be seen as uh, official Israeli policy. All right, Michael, very quickly, I've only got about 30 seconds. I mean, when you hear things like the sentiments that were expressed at that conference, is it going to make it more difficult for the Israelis to deny charges of ethnic cleansing? Of course. Uh, uh, these, I think, reflect um, uh, a much broader opinion upon the uh, Israeli center and right. I don't think there's an appetite among any leading Israeli politicians for a genuine two-state solution. I think what uh, uh, Benjamin Netanyahu says out loud, no Palestinian state, is probably the sentiment of, of a number of centrist right. uh, Israeli uh, politicians who, if they said a Palestinian state, they mean a little statelet that, that bears no relationship to okay. modern understanding. Okay of what a state is. All right, we have to leave it there. We have run out of time. Thank you to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C.